Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. It is an honor and a pleasure for me to introduce our final keynote address of the day, Dr. Zeren Turun. Dr. Turun has obtained uh, her master's degree at the University of Manchester and in 2009, DPhil at the European Institute, University of Sussex. She started her career as an interpreter at the Ministry of Defense in Turkey, where she worked for three years. After that, she enrolled as a research assistant at the Department for International Relations at the Middle East Technical University, METU. Today, Dr. Turan is a lecturer at the MET University uh, at the Department of International Relations, where she teaches on topics such as Turkey and the European Union, concepts and issues in European security, and, and many other topics. She's an author of many publications on Turkey, the European Union, and Turkey's foreign policy, and received the Jean Monnet Award for representation of the European Commission to Turkey. The topic that she agreed to speak on today, hopefully she will do in full, but she may only do partially, we were debating this earlier, uh, the EU's Mediterranean policy, challenges and prospects. And given the limited time, she said maybe she'll just talk about the, the challenges, uh, but then we might be too uh, pessimistic there. So I'm hoping there's room also to discuss the prospects. Uh, but ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a very, very warm welcome for Dr. Zeren Turun. Thank you. Well, thanks for the very well <laughs> introduction. Uh, it was interesting to remember those days at the Ministry of Defense, but I switched back to the academics. And I have to perhaps uh, warn you in advance that, I, that my speech is going to be informative, a professional sickness. I have to make my audience uh, to be at the same level to start with and to build upon a similar basis to continue with a, with a discussion afterwards. And because of the time constraints, I chose to, co I chose to confine my speech to the um, challenges that the EU has faced in its Mediterranean policies. And then, hopefully, you'll cooperate with me and start with a question, for instance, on the prospects in light of the Arab Spring, the wave of change in the Mediterranean, and how the EU has responded to these events in the region. Okay. Now, after this introduction, uh, let's move on. The EU's policies towards the Mediterranean are threefold. There's also the enlargement policy, but we're not going to be dealing with that today. The first one, established in 1995, was the Barcelona process. Now, the Barcelona process is also called the Euro-Mediterranean Partnership, and it forms the basis of the cooperation between the EU and the Middle East and North African countries. And then there comes the European Neighborhood Policy, which was established in 2004, uh, initially with a view to address the new Eastern members of the European Union after its big enlargement, but uh, later on it included the southern, members, uh, the southern partners in the Mediterranean for the European Union. Then there comes the Union for the uh, Mediterranean upon the initiative of President Sarkozy of France in 2008. And after reviewing, while we are reviewing these policies, the contents, the achievements, the limitations of these policies, we're going to be dealing with the challenges the EU has faced and is likely uh, to face in the future as well. Okay. Well, the three main objectives of the European, of the European uh, Mediterranean Partnership, the Barcelona process, have been the political and security chapter, mostly based upon peace, security, stability issues. And then there was the financial and economic chapter about uh, the establishment, for instance, uh, the most ambitious goal was the establishment of a free trade area covering uh, the European Union and the Mediterranean, both together in one framework. Then, the third chapter, which also relates my topic to uh, the, the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy's work, was about social and human chapter, and it was uh, supposed to cover the relationship with civil society actors in the, the European part of the Mediterranean as well as the southern shore of the Mediterranean. Now, Mediterranean partners, as you can see, they cover a whole different range. And, uh, well, uh, both in the Euro-Mediterranean partnership and then the subsequent European neighborhood policy, the relationship 
between the EU and Syria and Libya have been uh, problematic. Let's uh, cut it there. The European Mediterranean Partnership had two components, one multilateral, uh, one bilateral. Now, with a focus on the multilateral, we can say that the European Union, let's see, did not really achieve what it was supposed to do. Now, to start with, the Euro-Mediterranean partnership, uh, the, the process has excluded, for instance, the priorities of the Mediterranean partners, such as the Arab-Israeli conflict. Therefore, the multilateral process has been haunted by the conflict between uh, the partners in the Mediterranean. And this influenced uh, the relationship, for instance, that was supposed to be built within the framework of the Union for the Mediterranean as well. Multilateral uh, policies towards the Mediterranean, therefore, have been generally affected by the Arab-Israeli conflict. And since the EU refused to address this topic on its agenda within the, the framework of these structural policies, this meant that every time the Arab-Israeli conflict flared up, the multilateral process has been put to a halt, on a halt. And uh, in addition, for instance, um, showing us that the priorities of the Mediterranean partners were not really adequately addressed within these, frame, uh, within these frameworks is the fact that uh, the EU wanted to bring up the issue of weapons of mass destruction, but it didn't address the fact that the Israelis <laughs> already, uh, for instance, had some capability and the Arab neighbors were concerned about this. Now, the EMP, as I said, was enhanced by the European neighborhood policy. And let's see, where am I? I think I'm going back, sorry. <laughs> In the social, cultural, humanitarian field, let's focus on what the EU has achieved. Now, the Anna Lindt Euro-Mediterranean Foundation for Dialogue Between Cultures, established, based in, established in 2001, uh, based in Egypt. Now, this is a good achievement to promote intellectual, cultural, and civil society exchanges. And the Anna Lindt Foundation, for instance, has made, has concluded a huge survey on uh, perceptions about identity, culture, and religion in the Mediterranean, which was lacking uh, for us, especially the academics, uh, to work on. Then there have been uh, Euromed Heritage, Euromed Audiovisual, uh, established between the European and the Mediterranean partners. These are good achievements, but lately I must say um, that um, in one article I've seen a very critical remark, which I agree uh, with, uh, regarding the achievements of this framework, that uh, you know, the author was saying that the European Union has to go beyond establishing uh, relationships between the museums in the, uh, the EU and the Mediterranean, which I agree, I mean, no offense to the museums, but the relationship under the social and humanitarian uh, chapter, human field, cultural field, no doubt had to go forward if we took the, the, the goals that were written on paper. Now, the Euro-Mediterranean partnership has centered on a security and on a multi-dimensional uh, multi concept of security. Therefore, it included soft security issues, for instance, poverty, uh, development and migration. However, these two issues, for instance, poverty and development, they were not covered well. Again, showing us another challenge, you know, addressing the priorities of the Mediterranean, whereas the migration was well uh, brought up to the agenda. For instance, in 2005, the partners agreed that the migration is going to be the fourth uh, pillar of the Euro-Mediterranean partnership to deal with. Now, this has had consequences, which I would uh, say were not really positive. 
Uh, the Euromed Civil Forum, on the other hand, which was the main networking forum, uh, the framework that's going to bring the European civil society institutions, the think tanks, etc., with those in the in the Mediterranean, the Middle East, and Africa, uh, was meant to initially include those actors, the think tanks, the civil society institutions that were not registered with the political uh, regimes, with the states in these countries. However, in practice, this rule of including those civil society associations or the think tanks, which were not necessarily recognized by the governments in these countries, uh, was forgotten. In the end, in practice, only those civil society associations or think tanks which were recognized by these governments, the autocratic governments, as we now um, free to, to mention, um, the, 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 the actors that were recognized by these governments were only brought together on this, this, under, under this Euromed uh, civil forum. Therefore, the transformative potential which was there on paper, in theory, within the European uh, Mediterranean Partnership or the Barcelona process, was not brought to its full potential, I would say. Now, exchanges between cultural elites, uh, well, that's good. But in the end, uh, we could say that this may explain why uh, the European partners did not really know their counterparts who came from Islamic backgrounds, for instance, in the Mediterranean. So in, in, in practice, it brought forward a limitation, which of course will have repercussions when the, the European Union deals with uh, the results of the wave of change in the region. The fear of Islamic parties coming to power uh, this limited not only the social, cultural, human chapter, but also the relationship that was built around or under the political and security chapter, the focus on security issues, uh, particularly counterterrorism and migration, I would say did not bode well uh, because it didn't address the needs of these countries, the people's needs in these countries, because the security of these peoples uh, in the hands in the hands of these autocratic regimes was not on the agenda. While you could say, and I would agree, that this is not only the problem of the European Union, the, like Turkey, for instance, every other state, every other international actor has to find a counterpart, and it's forced at some point to enter into a relationship, a cooperative uh, relationship with, with whatever government you have. Um, well, that applies to the European Union as well, but since the European Union defines itself as a normative actor, as an actor, as an international organization that follows, that pursues, for instance, human rights, democracy, etc., that defines itself as a civilian actor who's trying to bring change without using military force, uh, the, this limitation, uh, the, the limitations of the Euro-Mediterranean partnership had consequences for the European Union and constitutes the basis for us to criticize the European Union today. Now, on the economic front, the result has been the same. Well, the, the uh, economic financial chapter had an ambitious goal which could work towards meeting the needs of these countries and these peoples. Uh, and it was the establishment of Euro-Mediterranean free trade area. This was supposed to come into. Uh, uh, this was supposed to be realized by the year 2010. And although the EU has concluded free trade agreements with almost. Uh, excluding Syria, the problematic relations with Syria and, and uh, Libya, with almost every uh, Mediterranean partner, the structure of the relationship, the, the way to establish this Euro-Mediterranean free trade area was problematic. While we define it as a hub and a spoke system, um, and it means that the European Union, it establishes free trade agreements with almost every Mediterranean partner, okay? It goes like this. So in the end, 
the European Union at the center has all the benefits because it has the free trade agreements with all these partners. Whereas because the European Union did not work towards the establishment of the same arrangement between southern, members, uh, southern partner states, sorry, uh, the benefits of this free trade regime is not shared across the southern shore of the Mediterranean. And therefore, the hub and spoke system benefits the European Union because Say you're a, um, a businessman, you would locate your firm or factory in one of the European Union countries because that means you can get access to almost all Mediterranean partner, whereas if you locate yourself in one of the East countries, say Egypt, you'll not have the same opportunity to, for instance, if the relationship or uh, the same agreement does not exist with any other uh, southern uh, country, southern Mediterranean partner, then you'll not enjoy enjoy the same benefits. Therefore, the relationship, the method, has benefited the European Union. Now, the achievement uh, should not be underestimated, though. Agadir Agreement uh, has been signed between four countries uh, in the Mediterranean including Egypt, Jordan, etc. So the, this framework uh, could be supported by the European Union, not to be totally pessimistic in this area, and it could be extended to the rest of the Mediterranean countries. Uh, with regard to promotion of democracy, human rights, and um, civil society actors. Now, in general, suffice it to say here that because of this limited participation to its forums, the Euromed Civil Forum, for instance, there was a limitation to start with. On the other hand, although the European Union retained its right to uh, fund projects that were not permitted by these regimes, it did not choose that option. Therefore, another limitation appeared, I would say, to realize the transformative potential of the Euromed partnership. For instance, the EU allocation to meta democracy, the fund, the budgetary framework, uh, between 1995-1999 has been only 0.6 percent of the total budget of, of, of MEDA. In this sense, we have problems. Now, moving quickly, because I don't have much time, I can send you the lecture notes, the PowerPoint slides later on so that you can see all the details. Uh, let's cover the European neighborhood policy. Now, the relationship was based on a, uh, on a bilateral mechanism. The EU established um, a bilateral relationship with all these partner countries. It included the the eastern neighbors as well as the southern uh, neighbors. Therefore, in one way, the Euro-Mediterranean partnership was complemented by the European neighborhood policy. It was going to advance the Euro-Mediterranean partnership by offering the possibility of differentiation. So we forgot about the multilateral aspect and therefore the community building opportunity that could be brought by a sustainable uh, Euro-Mediterranean partnership. Now that has been a loss and uh, in addition within the European neighborhood policy I would say the li that there had been additional limitations between the civil society actors because of this bilateral relationship established between the governments in these countries and the European Union represented by the European Commission. Now this move away from uh, community building and people to people uh, interaction or exchange, promotion of cultural diplomacy in other words was confirmed when uh, the Union for the Mediterranean was established to support specific uh, cooperation projects in, in economy and uh, in energy. Now let's have a look at these uh, areas. Oh, oh, where did I go? Okay, well it includes depollution of the Mediterranean, for instance, that's good. It includes environmental degradation, it includes uh, promoting projects on solar energy, for instance, in the Euro-Mediterranean. 
But then the project, the Union for the Mediterranean, lacked the financial resources. And when Israeli attacks started in 2008-2009 against Gaza, the Arab partners within the Union for the Mediterranean rejected sitting around the same table with Israel. Therefore, what confronted the European Union once more was the Arab-Israeli issue. So the big challenge confronts us again the conflict in the mid, uh, in the in the mediterranean in the middle east that harms the multilateral projects then uh, the challenge another challenge is to be pluralistic and inclusive to address the civil society actors which may not even be registered or recognized by the governments by whatever government that exists in the partner countries and then perhaps we could think about the application of, of uh, the conditionality principle consistently when these countries do not meet the standards of human rights democracy that are espoused by the European Union itself. The European Union did not pursue this conditionality principle to push these regimes towards more democracy and this has been a, a major shortcoming as well. Okay, I'll conclude it here. Sorry for not being in tandem with my PowerPoint, but I have been sent warnings from there, so I was scared that I'll be, <laughs> I'll be off limits. So I'll, I'm, I'm happy to answer your questions, and as, as I promised, I uh, will send you, we'll make sure that you, you get the, the PowerPoint presentation, uh, so that you can see the whole details of my reasoning and my criticisms. Okay, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. That would be excellent if you could send the PowerPoints. And what we can do, we're making a page for each of the speakers on the homepage where we can okay. put the video footage of your lecture, uh, sure. also the PowerPoint if you agree, as well as we'll do a small no interview problem, with you afterwards. Yes. So we'll give access to everyone to the full presentation. Be happy to take your questions and comments. Who would like to go first? <laughs> everyone is shy. But, uh, <laughs> no, don't be shy. Okay, Mr. Yakesh. Thank you. The initial title had something to do with the uh, southern part of the Mediterranean. Now that the Arab uh, Spring is on and it is still unconcluded, what is your guess about the effect of the uh, Arab Spring on Turkey-EU uh, relation on the future, mm. on the prospects? This was the question that you, you provoked us to ask. Uh, on the prospects of Turkey's reinvigorating of the uh, accession process? Okay. Well, that's a tough question, I must say, and I have to write a chapter, so <laughs> I am thinking about this question. I've been thinking about this question. Well, the issue, um, let's think about uh, the positive scenario. Um, a number, a majority of these countries make the choice uh, to transition towards democracy. And then Turkey's experience becomes valuable in this case, under this scenario. And in addition, in the long run, in the medium to long run, I would say that because these countries are more democratic and more stable, there will be uh, more hope for peace and stability uh, to be sustainable within the region. Therefore, one major criticism that Turkey would be a security consumer within the European Union if, it, if, it, if it's brought uh, as a member to the European Union, it, it will be gone under this positive scenario. In the short run, I would say, Turkey's experience uh, towards uh, you know, institutionalizing democracy secularism and different aspects of its uh, experience, such as living under the military coups even, may become useful for these countries. And I would say, looking at the comments uh, in the media, in the newspapers or journals these days, uh, there's plenty of hope, or at least they, there's exploration from the European Union actors. 
uh, to find ways to cooperate with Turkey in terms of, uh, of, of addressing the needs of these countries, to take a uh, cooperative uh, approach towards the Mediterranean, towards the Middle East and Africa, towards the countries that are undergoing change. And in this sense, there is, uh, even in the short term, I would say, a, a positive aspect that brings forward um, increasing cooperation between the European Union and Turkey in terms of the foreign and security policies. And uh, I would say if the relationship could be developed in this uh, possible uh, option, within this possible option, then uh, the, the exchange, since the exchange between Turkey and the European Union increases, the, the, uh, there will be less criticisms against Turkey's inclusion into the European Union as a member. And therefore, on the whole, uh, it would be um, helpful. I mean, uh, it would contribute to decreasing the criticisms against Turkey arising out of security issues. And since uh, it's going to increase the dialogue and interaction, this may also work towards decreasing uh, the prejudices, perhaps, that are directed against Turkey uh, at, at, the, at basically the, the public level. So um, I think it has a positive implication for Turkey-EU relationship. Well, the pessimistic scenario is not that pessimistic for the EU-Turkish relationship, but I would not, as a human being, want to see the, the negative scenario which builds upon uh, the consolidation or a re return to autocratic regimes in these uh, countries. And then both Turkey and the European Union, uh, they would be at loss, I think, on, on how to deal uh, with a return to politics as usual, and it wouldn't basically uh, lead to a positive outcome for Turkish inclusion to the European Union either. Thank you. Additional questions or comments? No? Okay, one more. Okay, final question. Move that. Yeah. My name is Paul Barker, a graduate student of international relations in Istanbul. Um, you talked about one of the main criticisms is this hub and spoke idea of where the EU is able to prosper from all of the southern members. Um, what roles do you think the European Union can play to encourage trade among the southern Mediterranean states um, in a variety of economic fields? Thank you. Well, um, I would say Turkey experiences the same problem in its customs union, for instance. Whenever the EU signs a free trade agreement with a third country, Turkey then has to knock on that country's door to ask for the same privileges, to ask for the same relationship that the EU has established because Turkey is not automatically included in this uh, negotiation of a uh, free trade agreement with uh, whichever country that the EU negotiates. So um, this has been a similar uh, outcome with regard to the establishment of the Euro-Mediterranean free trade area. The EU could work towards uh, extending its free trade agreements uh, between not only uh, itself and the uh, Mediterranean country in question, but it could encourage the Mediterranean country in question to extend the privileges, the, the uh, terms and conditions of um, the, the free trade area towards other southern, uh, other southern partners. Uh, I don't think it should be that difficult. I mean, in, time, in, in terms of time, time-wise, it would take a lengthy process, but then uh, the benefits, I think, uh, would overweigh the costs in terms of, of the effort and the time. Besides, the establishment of the free trade area, if the EU really encu encourages this south-to-south -south trade, then uh, this goes ultimately uh, to the, all the, the, the uh, core idea 
uh, of the, the establishment of the European community itself. If you remember after the Second World War, France and Germany, they, they were warring parties and then they came to an agreement that they're going to create a common trade area. It started with a small region and then it has been extended towards other countries and it included, uh, you know, extension, deepening of these free trade um, negotiations, uh, issues, areas, and it ended uh, with a, a monetary union in the end. So interdependencies, as the interdependencies increased, it worked t towards the establishment of peace as well within Europe. Now we're not talking about the possibility of war uh, in Europe any longer, it's unthinkable, but this was the basis upon uh, th this was the basis upon which the European Union itself was built. So in this case I think uh, allocating some time and effort towards convincing, even at times using conditionality, to convince the southern partners to extend their um, terms of condition, terms and conditions of their own free trade agreement with the European Union towards other southern member states may help. Basically, extending it to a multilateral level, I would say. I'm not an economist, though. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you very, very much for an excellent and informative, as you promised, uh, lecture. We really appreciated that. And I would ask everyone to please uh, help me to extend our gratitude to Dr. Zeren Torun. Thank you. Okay. Thanks.